If you've got a female dog who's leaking urine while they're sleeping, or if you're introducing a new cat into your house and you're wanting to reduce stress levels in all your other cats, or you have a puppy who you're wanting to wean onto solids, then today's episode is for you. But before I get into all of those questions, let's cue the intro. Welcome to Call the Vet, the show that answers all your dog and cat questions so they can live healthier, happier lives. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. And so welcome to the 30th episode of the Call the Vet podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Alex Avery, and I'm the veterinarian behind ourpetshealth.com. And my aim on this show is to answer all of your pet health questions so that you can look after them to the best of your ability, no matter where you live in the world and no matter what your resources are. I'm really grateful that you're here and that you're, you've are you chosen to share your valuable time with me. I know there's many other things you could be doing and listening to. So thanks for tuning into today's show. And if we are meeting for the first time and you do enjoy these episodes, episodes, then make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast because I've got loads more valuable and excellent questions to answer in episodes that are already lined up. Now, you can also get your question answered to feature on an upcoming show simply by heading over to callthevet.org. And if you head over to to callthevet.org as well, you'll find all of the show notes, the links and the downloads that I mention in today's episode, as well as the whole back catalogue of the 29 other episodes that have been released. Um, And also, the other thing that I wanted to say to to everybody today before I get started is just to to give you all a warning that there is an awful lot of blue green algae out at the moment certainly in the northern hemisphere Uh, it's late summer start of start of autumn and that's a classic time to to experience algal blooms in lakes and in rivers because water levels are low flow is slow and you can get um, a blue green algae bloom and the reason that you need to be worried about that or you need to be aware of that is if um, your dog gets into that water if they drink even just a small amount then it's potentially fatal within 15 minutes so you definitely want to be avoiding any waterways that have got that kind of problem going on now i've also actually just um rewritten and updated my complete guide to uh, blue-green algae poisoning in dogs. So if that's not something that you're aware of, if you want more details, then if you head over to callthevet.org or you can also get it on ourpetshealth.com and you can check out that guide. So I just wanted to bring you that little kind of update if you like just to make sure that you're all aware of the problem because I am seeing unfortunately um, several reports on social media about dogs who have been caught out have been poisoned and have unfortunately died so you know make sure that you and your family are aware of this risk so that you can all stay safe. And with that out of the way, I'm going to jump into my first question, which is from Manny who simply wrote, my dog has urine continually flowing while she's sleeping. How can I stop this happening? So this is a really um, or a not uncommon problem. And clearly it's one that's frustrating if it's happening to your dog, both for you and for your dog as well. And it's one that you definitely want to get to the bottom of so that you're not kind of constantly clearing up uh, urine soaked bedding and not having to put loads of washing on all the time. And really, there's a number of different causes of urinary incontinence that we need to consider in every case. So the first thing I always ask is, is it really incontinence or actually is your dog waking up and having an accident overnight? So you're going to see very different things. If they're incontinent, then they're going to be leaking in their bed. They're going to have a wet patch on their bed behind them when they wake up. If they're actually having accidents overnight, they're likely to be getting up from their bed, uh, going to the door maybe where they would normally get let out or walking around and you'll find a pool or a puddle of urine somewhere else. And now that's not likely to be due to incontinence. And diseases that can cause lots of urine to be produced uh, can definitely cause this. Uh, That's that's things like kidney disease, uh, liver disease, diabetes, for example. Um, Another problem can be senility. So that can also cause a loss of normal house training. uh, And so we get dogs that are are sometimes even more awake at night because senility also causes a change in the sleep-wake cycle. Uh, But again, they're going to be getting up and they're going to be going going to be going to the toilet in uh, a, an unusual place but that's not their bed cystitis is another thing that can cause an increased desire to urinate so even when with the best will in the world when you feel like you've got to go you've really got to go and that's no different for your dog so if they've got a cystitis then that can cause accidents to happen overnight and clearly those are all um, different medical problems that will have a different approach and a different treatment behind them now for those dogs that are incontinent there are again another 
number of different causes that can can result in that urinary incontinence. The most common is something called urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence, which is a little bit of a mouthful. And what effectively happens here is that the the normal valve that stops the urine flowing out of the bladder, so that's composed of the bladder neck and the urethra, which is the tube between the bladder and the outside world, um, it just becomes a little bit floppy and flaccid and uh, urine leaks out of the leaks out of the bladder now that's especially a problem when a dog is lying down because when they're lying down there's more pressure on their tummy on their abdomen that in turn causes more pressure to be pushing on the bladder and if the resistance to flow is lower then we're more likely to get leakage especially in a when a dog's uh, asleep and so not kind of naturally trying to control their urine uh, flow as well now other causes of urinary incontinence can be something called ectopic ureters so that's when the tubes that take the urine from the kidneys into the bladder are actually not uh, kind of flowing into the bladder in the proper place and they're bypassing the normal uh, resistance to flow and so you can get a leakage there. Now that's going to be more of a problem or that's going to first become apparent as a problem in a younger dog. So that can be while they're very young, certainly in the first um, you know, year, year and a half generally even earlier than that so if you've got an older dog that's never been incontinent before then it's unlikely to be an ectopic ureter problem although potentially it could be um we could have something called an intrapelvic bladder. Now that happens where the bladder is actually kind of tucked back in the abdomen and it's more within the within the pelvis and again that kind of interrupts the normal uh, resistance to flow of urine so that's another problem that we can get and then finally we can have nerve problems as well so if there's a problem with uh, the nerves that are controlling bladder innovation so flow, uh, controlling the normal bladder function uh, that can be something due to slip discs for example so intervertebral disc disease is a common cause of uh, urinary incontinence we can either get the case where the it's actually very easy for the bladder to be emptied so we have a reduction in resistance but we can also get urinary or apparent urinary incontinence when the bladder actually can't contract because what happens here is the bladder fills up and it becomes so full and so tense that that the kind of pressure forcing the urine out becomes really high and so you then get a drip 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 of urine even though the bladder is very full and the the dog can't actually go to the toilet they can't compress that bladder and, and express the urine normally in a full uh, urination and empty that bladder but you get this kind of constant dripping now clearly a dog's probably going to be pretty uncomfortable and there's going to be other problems there so that's really unlikely to be the case in in Manny's dog situation in this example but something to consider if your dog is leaking urine so those are the possible causes. Now, um, like I say, in a female dog, uh, which is what Manny's dog is, that is older than a year or two and only urinating while they're in their bed asleep, then this urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence is the most likely cause. Uh, and the reason that this is probably most common is that there is certainly a, a predisposition. Some entire female dogs will get it, but there is an increased likelihood, actually a three times increased likelihood in female dogs who are spayed. So a lot of our female dogs are spayed, quite rightly so in my opinion, uh, and there are a number of different health benefits for spaying your dog there are uh, some potential side effects as well and i've certainly discussed that separately and i'll leave a link in the show notes to my discussion about the pros and cons of spaying your dog but certainly urine um urine incontinence is probably one of the more common uh, side effects of that procedure now, when it comes to treating incontinence in a dog, assuming that we're dealing with incontinence, like I said before, there are a number of different causes and it's really important that we are treating the right thing, then the treatment options are primarily medical. So there are two main options here. So the first one is estriol, which is an estrogen supplement. So we're kind of replacing the hormones that are lost when we're spaying in effect. Um, and the other option is something called phenylpropanolamine, which again is a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, and this is actually probably the more effective treatment in the vast majority of dogs although some will respond to that some will respond to the other unfortunately some will need both uh, and some actually won't respond at all so if medication doesn't help although that really is uncommon certainly in my experience then first of all we need to be ac absolutely sure of the diagnosis and then there are several surgical options available depending on the cause so to be sure of the diagnosis that can involve taking blood tests it can be ultrasound it can be different x-rays and um, there's a number of different things that we can do there but one once we're happy with that diagnosis, then we can do a number of different surgeries and that 
you know, varies depending on what the cause of the urinary incontinence is. So we can actually reroute the ureters and put them in the proper place within the bladder if they're they're not already. We can create a or insert a artificial urethral sphincter to increase that resistance and keep the urine in the bladder until it's consciously expressed. You can actually pull the bladder back into the abdomen. That's a procedure called a colpo suspension for those dogs that have an intrapelvic bladder. And even you could give collagen injections into the neck of the bladder. Now, a lot of these surgeries or most, or if not all of these surgeries, are more specialist surgeries. So they're not going to be offered by your uh, routine general practitioner. And so if your dog isn't responding to medical management, there's a high chance that they will need to be referred to a specialist to, to get that sorted. Now, as for the success rate of surgical procedures, well, uh, really regardless of the procedure used, about 60% of dogs will become fully continent, so will be cured of their incontinence. About 30% of dogs that have surgery will improve, but will still require some medication. And then unfortunately, about 10% do not benefit at all from surgery. So like I say, don't worry too much or don't think too much about surgery because it's not something that needs to happen very often at all. And in the vast vast majority of cases vast majority of dogs with urinary incontinence their medication is going to sort it out uh, it will have to be maintained or it's likely to have to be maintained or else it will the problem will just recur but with medication uh, you'll be able to completely cure your dog's incontinence and then just before i move on to the next question i wanted to let you know that this podcast episode is brought to you by my knowledge vault so that's the one place to access all of my free downloads my free ebooks and all of my calculators that are all designed to help pet owners look after their pet keep them out of mischief keep them safe and make sure they're being treated to the best of your ability so it includes things like solving problem peeing in cats a guide to stress in cats pain checklists and treatment monitoring guides different drug information sheets uh, my summer dog care ebook uh, and that's really important when i think about the the blue green algae toxicity that i was talking about earlier so there's a number of other summer dangers that you should be aware of like heat stroke and it's important to keep your dog cool so you can check that out in the knowledge vault as well as my raw versus kibble ebook as well which takes you through a whole load of different questions you need to be asking yourself when it comes to deciding the best food for your pet so if you're interested in getting access to the knowledge vault and signing up to my newsletter then simply head over to callthevet.org today or you can go to ourpetshealth.com and you'll find uh, links and forms to sign up and gain access to all of those free resources next up is a question from Bridget who's actually already asked a couple of great questions in previous episodes and she continues with those great questions today and Bridget asks or Bridget writes and says I have a friend who's introduced a two-year-old Bengal into his family and he's got three other cats and things are not going so well so the new boy just wants to charge at the younger neutered girl and the Siamese and he wants to help rescue this Bengal but he fears he's going to have to pass on him any help would be greatly appreciated so thanks for that great question Bridget um, and there's yeah a number of different things we can do although it may not be you know uh, all, all a happy ending at the end of the day as you'll you'll kind of find out but really the first thing is to to supervise all interactions so that's really important especially when you've got a cat who's looking like they're going to attack uh, the others so making sure that you're supervising all interactions so you can intervene if things are starting to get a little bit um kind of a, a bit fractious uh, and also you don't want to force any interaction on the other three cats so we should always make sure that there are plenty of escape routes plenty of sp safe spaces for all of the cats to retreat to so when given the choice most cats will you know w will not pick a fight now some there's clearly exceptions to the rule and some will really kind of defend territory to the death if you like but if you've got plenty of escape routes plenty of safe spaces for the cats to to go to where they're going to be out of the way they're going to feel safe and they're going to be by themselves and that's going to greatly reduce their stress and reduce the chance of uh, the cats kind of getting into any serious mischief so remember too when you're thinking about escape routes and safe spaces that cats they really are 3d creatures so they like having spaces up high you know in cupboards and the top of wardrobes um, that kind of thing and cat towers and jungle gyms and other cat furniture that you can buy or that you can make uh, great for, for for that point of view now Having four cats in a house, unfortunately, that really is a recipe for stress to a greater or lesser degree. We like to think when we have multiple cats that they, you know, get on like a house on fire. There's no friction. They're great friends and great buddies and couldn't do without each other. Really, the more likely situation is that there is 
some stress going on now it might be that they are good friends and they just fall out occasionally it might be that really you know they tolerate each other uh but they you know and they've got everything worked out they've got the the hierarchy worked out if you like and they learn to live with each other and that's probably the most common situation and then sometimes you know they they really just dislike each other and they try and stay as far away as possible from each other it might be that when you're there they you know they're both in the same room or even they're both sitting on the same sofa but they're as far away apart as possible from each other uh, so you know unless your cats are um, mutually grooming so grooming each other licking each other um, or if they're sleeping kind of intertwined the chances are that there is some degree of stress there and unfortunately the more cats there are the higher the likelihood of significant stress being present is so we really need to be realistic about the situation when we're introducing cats into any household but especially in this case when there are already three resident cats So one of the big causes of stress uh, is actually a competition for resources. And when we're thinking of resources for our cats at home, we're thinking about uh, water bowls, um, food bowls and litter trays. And so it's important that we have the right number of those, but also that they're they're in the right location. So as a general rule, uh, there should be one more of each of those things than the number of cats in the house. So in this case, with four cats, you're going to need five litter trays, five water bowls and five feeding station so you can have the water and food next to each other but it shouldn't be next to any litter trays you know we don't eat on the toilet and our cats are clean and really don't want to do that either but we also need to be locating them in correct places as well as just having them separated so cats when they're eating or when they're going to the toilet they like to be able to look out and kind of survey the 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 surrounding environment without there being a risk of them being ambushed or pounced on so we you know putting them in the corners of rooms is really good because your cat can look out and survey the room without worrying about another cat coming behind them and interrupting them doing whatever it is they're doing Um, and also they should be in quiet places so having um, something right by the front door where everyone's walking in and out all the time is not going to be the best pace for for anything food bowl or litter tray so competition for resources is really common uh, a really common cause of stress and something that we can quite easily fix although when there's more cats that can mean that that your house ends up just covered in litter trays and food bowls and that kind of thing so that's another thing to to consider as for other things we can do we can use uh, something called fellow a which is a pheromone and that's the normal pheromone that's produced when cats actually if you see them rubbing their cheek up against things they're releasing this pheromone to mark their home territory uh, it makes them feel safe it makes them feel calm when they're around there and fellow a is a synthetic version of that it comes in a, a plug-in uh, air freshener type unit and that releases that into the environment in that room now if your cats are going to multiple rooms you may need multiple multiple diffusers which can add up in cost but that's going to be the best way to do it it does come in a spray as well which is good maybe for spraying on bedding um, primarily for also taking uh, put spraying in your cat carrier if you're taking your cat to the vet and that kind of thing is another good use for the spray and then there are some dietary supplements so things like Carmex or Zilkeen can also help just to reduce the stress levels which may make the introduction more successful and then the final kind of comment from Bridget's question is just um, wondering if this new cat is actually neutered because if he's entire then he's going to be much more territorial and much more likely to to attack and and much more kind of wired and and anxious about having other cats in his environment so getting him neutered would be another thing to think about as well that's not going to be a quick fix and it's not going to be a complete um, fix by itself we need going to need to do all those other things and it's going to take a month or so for hormone levels to go down before we see the full benefits of that nutrient but it's certainly another uh, thing to consider with this um, young Bengal cat so you know I hope that um, the situation can be well controlled but at the same time uh, as I said at the very beginning we also need to be realistic and we also need to think about the well-being of the three original cats as well so it's it's in my mind unfair to to rescue this cat if it's causing serious stress in the other cats and makes their life miserable for a long long period of time if things aren't set um, you know settling down so it may well be that the consideration needs to be made that um, this young cat needs to be found another home unfortunately but you know it, it's better to to make that decision and find him a fantastic forever home now that you know his personality you know his temperament and you can think of the ideal uh, situation the ideal family to rehome him to so I hope that helps uh, with settling down this question Bridget and then just remember that the information that I give in these podcasts is not to substitute for a consultation with 
an examination with your pet's veterinarian and it should not be taken as specific advice for any individual pet with any specific problem. So if your dog or cat is unwell, if they're injured, if they're suffering from any kind of problem or you've got concerns, then talking to your vet is always going to be the best course of action. Get your questions answered at callthevet.org. And then my final question this week comes from Siobhan, who writes, I'm looking to wean my three-week-old puppy to solid foods. Where do I start? I've been bottle feeding him as he was rejected by his mum. So, uh, you know, it's it's not an uncommon situation that we find ourselves in. I'm um, bottle feeding a, a puppy, and that's yeah often because we've got really big litters uh, and mum's rejected them or just simply can't cope. Or maybe uh, the mother has had uh, something like low calcium, so eclampsia, and, and so no nursing isn't a great idea because it will be dangerous and so the puppies are taken away and hand fed. So three weeks is about as early as you can get when we come to start weaning. So, uh, you know, it is early and it's going to take time, but definitely now is the time to think about that and start start that process because ideally weaning a puppy is a long and gradual process. So it's not something that happens overnight. And actually, if we can make it gradual, normally so when a puppy is on their mother and being weaned and we're wanting to wean them we want it to be a normal uh, a long drawn out process it's not always possible clearly and when bottle feeding that's going to be especially the case because bottle feeding it's incredibly labor intensive um you know it's really really challenging to do a good job and i know siobhan's done a great job because um she actually doesn't live too far away from me and um yeah certainly i've been uh, kind of messaging her um for advice and just to find out how things are going and and so far things are going really well and the puppy's doing really well which is fantastic but you know it's hard work and yeah we want weaning to maybe take a little bit of a shorter period of time if we're bottle feeding so typically what's going to happen is pups are going to spend longer and longer periods of time away from mum and as they take on more food her milk is going to gradually dry up so ideally we want weaning to be completed at about eight weeks of age now puppies are often completely weaned and then rehomed at six weeks six weeks of age but really for the average puppy i think being on mum that little bit longer having mum's milk that little bit longer is a better situation because there's nothing quite like a mother's milk for early growth and for health um, and as well as that time spent with mum and all the other litter mates learning how to be a dog and how to behave things like bite inhibition is really important and is all part of the the kind of socialization and learning uh, learning benefit as well that we need our young puppies to have so we don't want to be rushing this situation especially if we've got a dog who is um, feeding her puppies normally we want to be finishing weaning at about eight weeks of age but you know for Siobhan absolutely we can start weaning now at three weeks um, and hopefully it's only going to take um, you know a week probably more likely a couple couple of weeks three weeks maybe before we are completely weaned um, at you know at six weeks that's something good to, to aim for so you can buy a weaning formula um, but equally starting off with you know selecting a breed appropriate high quality puppy diet is probably the way to go especially if you're bottle feeding so you're going to be supplementing and you're going to already have a uh, um, milk replacer puppy milk replacer and it is important that you do use a puppy milk replacer you don't want to use um, cow's milk or anything like that because it doesn't have all the requirements it doesn't have everything that's needed in the right ratios for puppy growth so if at all possible you want to get a puppy milk replacer that's going to be the best thing um, and yeah feeding a breed appropriate so that is really from a, based on size so what's this adult's um, weight going to be if it's going to be less than 10 kilos or 22 pounds then you want to be feeding a small breed puppy food if it's a, a big dog so over um, about 25 kilos then you want to be feeding a large breed puppy food because you know it's very important we, we get that right especially with large breed dogs if they're growing too quickly which will happen or is much more much more likely to happen if we're feeding a, a medium or a small breed dog food then they can definitely get developmental problems they can get joint disease when they're very young and that can be really um, pretty severe so we want to be choosing a high quality breed appropriate diet um and we want to be making up a gruel. So mixing it in with water, um, kind of mashing it up. It doesn't need to be blended, but it should be um, mashed up. So it's a, it's a gruel, uh, either with water or with the puppy milk replacer. Like I say, don't use cow's milk and have that 
accessible to your puppy uh, for periods of time. Now, you want to be keeping that in a shallow bowl or a baking tray or something like that because you don't want them drowning if they're falling into a, a high-sided bowl or getting stuck in a high-sided bowl as well. Um, you know, could cause problems. So, you know, weaning, it definitely is a messy business because your puppy's going to um, wade through that tray. They're going to play in their food. They're going to make a right old mess. So, you know, be aware that that's going to be the situation. But when they're, well, they've got they've got the food there, we want to be encouraging them to eat. And we can do that in a number of ways. So you want to be offering that to them when they're they're hungry. You can certainly make the the times between feeding uh, with bottle with bottled milk. You can spread those out so that the puppy is hungry when you're offering them them this fresh food. And you do want to offer them fresh food regularly. You don't want to be leaving uh, the food down for hours and hours where it's going to get dried out. It's going to get flies on it, especially if it's hot, you know, and it's going to go um, you know a bit rancid. So we want to be encouraging to eat with fresh food warming it up is a good idea so if we think uh, we should be warming up the the bottled milk ideally we want it to be a kind of body temperature and the same for the food just to encourage them to eat you can pop it on your finger get them to lick it off your finger to start things off and like I say make sure it's nice and fresh as well now you can also start off by having the milk replacer alone available so if they're already taking that milk replacer in the bottle then just having that accessible in a very shallow um, saucer again it's going to get them used to the idea that they're able to uh, kind of choose and lap up lap up their food and lap up their water at the same time and then gradually just add some food to make it a thicker and thicker gruel like I say you don't need to blend it and actually having kind of different sized chunks in it can can help get them into the habit and get them used to the idea of taking the food and chewing it before they're taking it it is important at the same time that we always need to have fresh water available too so especially as uh, the weaning progresses and the bottle feedings drop or they get less and less or more spread out then you want to make sure that you've got fresh water are available too so that there's no risk of dehydration and then as everything's going really well just start to spread out feeding times offer keep offering a fresh batch of food before bottle feeding and really the big thing to do when we're well when we're bottle feeding completely you know from from the get-go so when we first start bottle feeding all the way through to finishing weaning and beyond is keeping a close eye on your puppy's weight so every day they should be gaining weight if they're not if the weight is staying constant or if they're losing weight then they're clearly not getting the amount of food uh the amount of nutrition that they need to cope with the demands of growing and of being a puppy you know they need a lot of energy for that growth especially in the the early early weeks uh so monitor that weight if things are not get, not gaining or they're losing weight then steps really need to be taken to to correct that so giving more uh more bottle feeds increasing the amount that you're feeding each uh, you know each bottle feed um and also kind of trying to encourage them even more to accept that food and to get them eating but you know normally it goes really smoothly there's generally not really any problems you know it is an effort but then bottle feeding taking on a foster puppy a rejected puppy is you know it's hard work it's incredibly rewarding um you bond with the puppy amazing well now if you're fostering and you're actually then going to rehome the puppy that can be really difficult because you do get such a strong attachment to them um, and it's you know like I say it's very rewarding but it is hard work um, and you need to be prepared for that work right up until they're weaned and then after they're weaned because we need to make sure that we're uh, you know socializing them and doing all the other things that we need to do to make sure that they stay healthy and happy well into the future and that's it for this episode of the podcast I hope you enjoyed those questions and those answers were useful for you and interesting even if you're not directly experiencing those situations if you do enjoy it make sure that you're subscribed and i'd appreciate it so much if you do have a spare couple of minutes if you could leave me a review over on itunes or over at rpetshealth.com slash review just to help more people discover this podcast reviews help more than you can imagine with with discovery and with rankings and all that kind of thing on the different podcast platforms uh, and so you know just to improve that discoverability and allow me to help more pets I'd appreciate your review so much remember too as well that you can head over to callthevet.org where you'll find all the links and downloads uh, and other details mentioned in today's show and until next episode I'm Dr Alex take care You've been listening to Call the Vet. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode of the show that answers all of your pet questions.